And our opening scripture is found in Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. So Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. I want to welcome all of you who are joining online on Facebook, those who will be watching later on YouTube. And it is a joy to be together in the house of the Lord this morning. So Romans chapter 15, beginning at verse 4 on this second Sunday of Advent. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs, so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, I will sing hymns to your name. Again it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will rise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. Thank you for gathering us together. And we thank you for the hope that you give us in yes, Christ Father. Jesus, our Savior and Lord. May we grow in that hope, and may we be possessed by that hope. And we pray, Lord, that you would be at work in our lives, that we would actually bring praise to you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. And again, we're thinking about that time when um, the people were longing for a Messiah, longing to have a Savior that would save them. Um, and so we're going to sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus this morning. And then, um, do you know that Savior came? And we're going to sing about, What child is this who laid to rest? Uh, this, this is Christ the King. And then we're going into Silent Night. Holy Night. All is calm, all is quiet. And then how Jesus was able to sleep in heavenly peace. So let's join this morning this morning and just give a praise to the Lord today. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Psalm number 72, as we prepare to go to the Lord in prayer. Psalm number 72. And do you have any phrases or things that you'd like to bring before the Lord? Any phrases, things, special prayer requests that you'd like to voice today? I kind of do have a phrase. I want to praise the Lord for the wonderful drive we had out to Tocero yesterday. I used to live in Tecatito, Mexico, and used to, my ex-wife and I used to cross the border every morning, Monday to Friday, to come and work, and the drive was just so beautiful, reminding me of so many good memories. Yes, and thank the Lord for all the beautiful Christmas decorations that are up, and we got a tree to decorate now, so we're praising God for that. Anyone else? Praises or pains this morning? justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. He will judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. The mountains will bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. He will defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. He will crush the oppressor. He will endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon through all generations. He will be like rain falling on a golden field, like showers watering the earth. In his days, the righteous will flourish. Prosperity will abound till the moon is no more. He will rule from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. The desert tribe will bow before him, and his enemies will lift the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of distant shores will bring tribute to him. The kings of Sheba and Seba will present him gifts. All kings will bow down to him, and all nations will serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy, and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence. For precious is your blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. Let grain abound throughout the land, on the tops of the hills may it sway. Let its fruits flourish like covenant, let it thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever, may it continue as long as the sun. All nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Amen. Yes, so this concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse, but it won't conclude our prayers. Amen. And so continue to pray out, and then I'll pray, and then we'll close with the word of prayer together. I wish you all to thank you, my Lord, for the privilege to be in your house. We're here to look up to you. Fellowship with each other, your best. Father, we just give you praise because of who you are. You are the uh, creator, the maker of the whole universe. Uh, you're the one that keeps us. You're the one that sustains. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, you're the one that knows everything about us. everything that we're going through. Yes. We just know go through. Hallelujah. And you're the one that, that plans, that prepare a way for us. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Prepare hope for us. Yes. And this is your son, Jesus. And we just give you thanks and praise for that this morning. And we lift up those who uh, requested this morning. Yeah. We lift up those who are hurting this morning. Yes. Yeah. Those who are sick and we see the chronic to heal. Yes. We pray for the healing. All the pain that is going through. And that's it. And that's taken. 
But then you uh, know you know everything about it. Mm -hmm. And you know everything about all of us here. You think the brother Mario and yes, Tony and all the other people here. Mm -hmm. And we lift them up to you. And we just pray, Father, that we can continue to trust you in everything. Be drawn closer to you. To be, to be changed. To be in that image that you want to know. And with our leaders, uh, we, just, we, just, we just can't praise you enough. We just can't do it now. And we just love you, Lord. We just thank you again for being with us today. And we thank you that you are the one who we can go to for whatever is going on. And we just give you praise for the rest of the day. And we do the service that we are here with your word. That we will uh, receive the word and take it in your name. And we give you thanks and praise for your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Gracious Father, thank you for waking us up this morning with life, the joy, and with the peace in our hearts, and with the hope in you. We thank you, Father, that some of us are here, we made it here wobbling. Some of us made it here with hurting, with health issues, so we thank you that we're here. Yes, yes. And gracious Father, we, we think about those folks right now that are broken, that are living out there in the street, homeless, that uh, we, we also pray for individuals that are going through a divorce, that are, uh, that are going to spend these days, these, these uh, days of festivity, joy, peace in you, that some of those folks have lost the sense of hope in you, mm -hmm. as I did many years ago. And I thank you, Lord, that you're the God who revives, yes. restores, yes. and, and just fills us with your presence. Yes. And I thank you, Father, that you be with the prisoners in the prison, mm -hmm. that you be with, with the downtrodden, with the hurting right now. They, during this time of season, we come in here with our aches and pains, but we have joy, we have your peace, we yeah. have our, we have hope in you. Yeah. Some of these folks, Lord, they have no hope, Lord. So I cry out to you, Lord, that you will bless your word as we just read, that, you're, that you, that you uh, reach out to the hopeless, that you reach out to the downtrodden, the distressed, the sorrowful, and they need your help, Lord. I pray that you give them a helping hand, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Gracious and Holy Father, I know that we are grateful to be in your house today. We thank you for waking us up and we thank you for putting it within us to be able to be here, to come together, to praise your name, and to cast all of our fingers upon you, and to learn of you and to learn your ways. When we come confessing that you are our maker, that you are our creator, we recognize that you created the heavens and the earth and the fullness that are in and all belongs to you. And we recognize that that also means that you made each of us. You created each and every one of us on purpose. We're not self-made, we're not an accident, we're not a mistake, but you created every single one of us on purpose. Yeah, and God is made of us. Oh, we give you thanks for that. Great Father, that you empower us to live into that purpose, that we would reflect your character, your yeah. love, and your grace to one another. Mm-hmm. Help us, Lord, not to be turned in on ourselves. Help us to be turned towards you and turned outwards towards each other. Mm-hmm. And we thank you, Lord, that you've grown above, you stood well in the life of our every care, of every need. We're grateful that you didn't just make us and then walk away and be done with us, but you stayed engaged in our lives. And you you watch over us day by day. Thank you for how you provide for us and we are able to use. And we pray, Father, that you would use those who are struggling financially, those who are needing work, those who are needing better work. We pray that you make a way that you would be provided. We thank you for the job you provided, Jose. Thank you for his good work and good work. We pray, Lord, that you strengthen him and just let your light shine through him and Lord as we give you thanks for Jose's work we trust that this will be encouragement to others who are seeking words and housing uh, just the various needs help us Lord to realize that we never face those needs alone we can do it all so if you first in your kingdom and your righteousness you make a way and you provide for us and Lord we're thankful that you care about our health and we pray Lord that you would touch each and every one here who's struggling 
dealing with health issues. He has to work for Ron if he touches hip. There be 100% recovery, yeah. uh, full strength and full movement. Uh, we pray for Brother Mario the Lord. We ask to touch upon him and strengthen him and for full recovery and new strength in today. Yeah. And Brother Tony as well. Yeah. Lord, our list could go on, but we look to you. Mm -hmm. You are our healer and you're the one that we trust. And we thank you for all the ways you provide and care for us. Be with all of the doctors and the nurses and all the care that they give, Lord. Watch over them and give them a little respect. Father, we pray that you would be with those who are going through difficult times. May they sense your nearness. Whether that's difficult times in terms of relationships, difficult times in terms of um, a, a loss of direction, and we pray, Father, that you would give new direction, and that you would restore relationships, and that you would bring healing in every facet of your life to come. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord. And we confess our sins to you, and we confess our need for your grace and your mercy afresh every day. Yeah. We pray that you cleanse us and purify us and grant us your spirit, empowering us to live faithful and true to you. Help us to trust you wholeheartedly. Help us to love one another more and more deeply. We pray that you truly would be glorified in our lives. To grant us your spirit that we might be able to discern right from wrong, that we might be able to discern what is best for their lives and be filled with the fruit of your righteousness. And Father, we thank you for those that you have blessed us with, to encourage us, and to help us to follow you more closely, and to help us to know you better. And Lord, help us to be that kind of a brother, that kind of a sister to someone yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. Use us, Lord, to point someone towards you. Lord, we do bring everything to you. Thank you for the privilege of casting all of our cares upon you. We do pray for the incarcerated today. And we pray for their families. We yeah. pray, Lord, that you can lead the time and you bring restoration. We pray for those who are on the streets today. And again, we pray for their families as well. And the brokenness and the hurt and the heartache that's there. Yeah. Lord, we trust you and we pray for your healing and for your kingdom. Yeah. Yes, Lord. And Lord, we pray that you use those who are dealing with addictions today. We ask for liberation. And again, Lord, we know that this impacts families. And so, Lord, we pray for healing in the families as well. Yes. And Lord, for all those who may need a new start in some kind of way, we pray, Lord, that you bring that about. Mm -hmm. And that there would be a fresh realization that you are God who makes things new, that you are the one who truly does give new start. Mm -hmm. We pray for our community. Pray for our city, pray for our state and our nation and really the whole world. Leadership at every level, Lord, give them grace to seek you first. Give them wisdom for all the challenges that they face. And we pray, Lord, that you give them integrity as well. In the midst of such pressure to compromise and to be bought out, we pray, Lord, that you empower them to operate with integrity and to serve and to do what is best. Give them your vision. And then, Lord, we pray for us, your church, on this corner and across the street and all corners of the globe. Grant us your spirit, Lord, that we might be faithful witnesses, that those around us might come to know who you are by, by your gracious and powerful work in our lives. Transform us more and more into your glory and to truer and truer reflections of Christ Jesus, not just so that our lives are better, but so that the world might know the you are the God who truly does say that you are the one who redeems and you are the one who makes new. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for giving the offering plates over there in the back, and you're welcome to leave your offering there. I know some of you give online and mail your offering in, and just want to say thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, we have a few announcements, and so tonight there's no service here. Tonight we are not doing Zoom. Uh, we're having service at Living Water, which is downtown, on 16th and Market, and that's at 6 o'clock tonight. So service, 6 o'clock tonight at Living Water. And so if you need a ride, uh, let me know. But otherwise, if I don't hear from you, I'll just assume you're going to show up there. And so 6 o'clock, Living Water. Uh, and then, let's see, what, is, what else do we have coming up? On 
December 16th, so not this Friday, but a week from Friday, uh, that is the Christmas dinner. And so Debbie Tucker and her husband Mike will be kind of putting that dinner on. Uh, we want to be here to help out with that and to celebrate. And so that's not this Friday night, that is a week from Friday night. And then next Sunday night, uh, we will be going Christmas caroling. And so if you want a Christmas carol, make sure that you're here next Sunday night uh, so that we can do that together. And I think those are the main announcements. Am I missing anything? I think that's it. Uh, again, I want to thank everyone who's helped with decorating the church. I think it's beautiful. And uh, uh, Brother Matt went out with Brother Richard, and I'm not sure who all went, but they got a tree. And so we got a tree to put up. And so we want to get that up and get that lit. Okay, uh, Advent, and so our Advent wreath and candles, and so you can see that there are four candles, Advent is the season that approaches Christmas, and you may think Advent is all about preparation for Christmas, but it's really more than that. Um, the word Advent means to come, and with Advent, we're not just anticipating Christmas when Jesus came as a baby in a manger. With Advent, we're anticipating his return, his coming again in all of his glory to bring judgment, to bring peace upon the earth. And so the four Sundays before Christmas, those are the Sundays of Advent. Those are the Sundays in which we anticipate very intentionally Christ's return. And we light candles because as Christ returns, uh, he is the light of the world. And so he is, he, he is approaching, is getting closer. And so the light increases. And so it's a kingdom of light. It's a kingdom of integrity. It's a kingdom that reveals. And the light shines in the darkness. The darkness does not comprehend it. The darkness does not overcome it. And so we light the candles in anticipation of his coming and his kingdom. You'll notice that three of the candles are purple. And that symbolizes the royalty of Jesus, that he is king. You'll notice one candle is pink. And that symbolizes the joy that Jesus gives. Uh, it, this is not a kingdom of tyranny or a kingdom of oppression. This is a kingdom of joy. And then you'll notice that the wreaths are placed in, or excuse me, the candles are placed in a wreath. And so that symbolizes that his kingdom is everlasting and is made of evergreen. And again, symbolizing not simply everlasting, but life giving. And then the center candle is, is the Christ candle that is lit on Christmas Day, and it is white in all of its purity, and all of Christ's purity. And so we light the candles, we look forward to Christ, we anticipate Christ's return, and this reminds us that Jesus is coming, and there's actually good news that he's coming, that he's coming with his kingdom. And so I've asked Brother Matt and Brother Richard to come, and they're going to light um, the first and second candle today. And the passage of scripture for the lighting is Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. So it looks like Brother Richard is going to read. So Isaiah 11, 1 through 10, and Brother Matt, if you light those two candles. Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. His root, from his root a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, spirit of wisdom and of understanding, spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decision for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. 
The cow will feed with the bear, the young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw with the fox, and the infant will play near the hole of a cobra. And the young child put his hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy. On all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as the banner for the people. The nations will rally to him, and the place of rest will be glorious. Amen. 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 Thank you, person very much. All right, uh, question for today. What are your favorite Christmas lights? What kind of Christmas lights do you like? And then part two of the question is, what is the message of Christmas lights? So go ahead, talk to your neighbor, share with them about your favorite kind of Christmas lights, and then the message of those lights. Matthew chapter 3, 
verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His own <coughs> fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That was right. Father in heaven, we thank you for this good day. We thank you for your love and your mercy upon us and how you've already been at work in our midst, ministering to us and amongst us. And we pray that as we turn our attention to your word, that you would speak afresh to us. Give us ears to hear you. May our hearts be open to receive you. And may we be mindful to obey you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we talked a little bit last week, and even already today, uh, Advent is this much-needed reminder that Jesus is coming. And it's easy for us to forget that. And so on the church calendar, the Christian calendar, these Sundays have been set aside to help us remember, to help us focus on that truth. Because our tendency is to think that, well, tomorrow's probably going to be like yesterday, and that history's not really going anywhere. Things just kind of go in circles if they go anywhere at all. And it's real easy for us to think that there's no purpose, that God's really not that engaged moving history forward. Uh, sometimes we might think that God helps me in kind of my little moment here and there, but, but in terms of kind of the big picture of history, it's like that's just a human product. And that's just the product of humans making decisions after decisions after decisions. And we kind of forget that God is actually over history and moving history forward. And that God actually has a destination that God is moving history towards. Amen. And so Advent is really important for us to kind of, kind of step back and step out of kind of our culture for a moment and think, wait a minute, no. God is over history, God is at work in history, and God is moving history towards a particular destination, a goal. And where God is moving history is the return of Christ. Hallelujah. And the God alone knows that day that Jesus is coming back. But God is moving history. And history is not just a human product. It's not just a human enterprise. That God is actually engaged and at work to move history towards that day when Jesus returns. And so it's important for us to remember that. A little bit more in terms of thinking about this day that God is moving history towards. That it's a good day. And it's a day when Jesus will come and, and put all things right. And so it's a good day. It's a hopeful day. And we will hear more about that today. Now last week, our scriptures helped us to focus in on two main truths. And number one, the reality of that day. That that day is coming. And whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we're prepared for it or not, that day is coming. And so the scriptures reminded us of kind of the reality of that day. And the second thing that the scriptures helped us to think about last week is the importance of living these days so that we're ready for that day. That given that that day is coming, that should shape how we go about living these days. That these are the days we have. These are the days we've been blessed with. And so how we live these days, we need to be ready for that day. Because we don't know when that day is coming, but it is coming. And if that day comes, we'll have to give an account for how we went about life in these days. And then the 
The third thing that we thought about last week, the importance of these days, given that that day is coming, how do we live right? How do we live prepared? And we realize that I really can't prepare in and of myself that is through the grace of God that I can be prepared. It's through the gift of His Holy Spirit that I can actually begin to live right so that I live in such a way in these days that I'm ready for that day. Now, our scriptures today, they pick up on that theme of that day and these days, and they refine it a little bit more. And so in terms of that day, the word is hope. And in terms of these days, the word is repentance. And so we kind of have this, this thing going on between hope and repentance in our scriptures today. And so we have two scriptures that really emphasize the hope, and then we have one scripture that really calls us to think about repentance, to think about change, to think about what changes do I need to make in my life to be ready for that day. So I want to start with the hope passages first. And so let's go ahead and go back to Isaiah chapter 11, the passage that Brother Richard read for us. And if you were at men's breakfast yesterday, you'll recognize that this passage fits very well with Isaiah 9, where Tony worked with us a little bit yesterday. But chapter 11 and verses 1 through 10, and what I want you to begin to pick up on is the hope of a new king. So it was a dark time, and they had bad king after bad king after bad king. And yet they had a promise from God that there would never fail to be a son on the throne from David, and yet David's sons weren't doing so well as king. And so Isaiah has this word of hope in terms of a new king. So I'll pick it up at verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. So we're talking about a new king from, from David's line. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and power and understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So this king is going to be different. This king is going to be spirit-empowered, wisdom from the spirit, and this king is going to delight in putting God first. Amen. Rather than putting himself first, rather than putting his own desires first, this king is going to delight in the fear of the Lord. That means he's going to delight in serving God and putting God first. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. He's not going to be deceived. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. A king who's actually going to make things right. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness to stash around his waist. Are you getting this king? That this king is going to be empowered by God to bring about real justice, to practice righteousness himself, and to establish God's peace. Look how deep this piece is. Verse 6, Isaiah 11, 6. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will leave them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all on holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow. That's some peace. Okay, let me try to help you think about how deep this peace is. That there will be no violence, not just between humanity, not just between nation and nation, there will be no violence even among the animals. 
And it's not that the ox is going to become a lion or the lion an ox. They'll still be distinct, a lion and an ox, but what are they going to eat? Vegetarian. Vegetarian. <laughs> Plants. So no longer is there going to be an animal that devours another animal. No longer is there going to be an animal that devours a human. So that you can even have your child playing by the viper's nest. This piece goes back to Genesis 1 before the fall. Okay. If you look back in Genesis 1 and you give it a close read, you will see that on day 6, yes, God creates humanity on day 6 and blesses us and tells us to be fruitful, to multiply, and to fill the earth. But you will also see that God says, I've given you all the green plants for your food, just as I gave them to the animals. And the picture that we get in Genesis 1, on day 6, after God has created humanity, and God saw all that God had made, and God saw it was very good, is that there is no violence anywhere. Unless munching on spinach is violent. Okay, because every animal, as well as every person, is simply eating plants. And so that's, that's why you have this language in terms of these predators being next to these animals that would be the prey, and they're eating together, and there's no harm. Because you didn't have bloodshed at any level until you had the rebellion of humanity against God. And so Isaiah is seeing a day when this king is going to be raised up by God and the Spirit of God is going to be upon them. And he's not going to be deceived and he's not going to serve himself or have his own hidden agenda. But he's actually going to fear God, putting God first. And as this king puts God first, then God empowers this king to bring about a new day of complete justice and peace. So that we go back, if I can say it that way, to creation before the fall. We go forward to a new creation, a new day, in which the fall has been overcome. And we have this incredible peace. Now, I'll just be honest with you, I'm not ready to go vegetarian. But I sure like this day, this anticipation of peace. And how's that going to come about? It's going to come about through this king. Now that is our hope. Our hope that we really have this day that's coming. Hope in a corrupt and dark time. And basically God is saying once again, let there be light. Because if you think back in creation, what's the first words that God said? Let there be light. Let there be light. The earth was full of darkness, it was formless and void, and God's first words, in the midst of that darkness, let there be light. And then, thinking back to the creation story more, remember that line, there was evening and there was morning, day one. Now, I don't know about you, but I normally think in terms of morning and evening. But the scripture is really specific. There was evening and there was morning. I think about the day starting in the morning going to night. But here we have there was evening and there was morning day one. Why do you think it might be that way? Because there was darkness and there was light. There was darkness and God is a God who is always saying, let there be light. And so here in the midst of this dark time in Isaiah's world, it's like God is saying once again, let there be light. How's that light going to come? It's going to come through this king. And God is going to raise this king up and bring about this new day in the midst of darkness where there is real and lasting peace. Thank you, Lord. Let's go to our next hope passage. I mean, that is hopeful. Let's go to our next hope passage. And that is over to Romans. Romans chapter 15. Verses 4 through 13. So we have the hope that this king is going to be raised up who will establish God's peace and practice God's righteousness. 
Now, in between Isaiah and Romans, we know there is Jesus. And that Jesus is that king, and Jesus established peace through his death on the cross, but his kingdom has not yet come in its fullness. He is returning. But look with me at 15.5, no, 15.4 through 13, and I want you to see the hope that fills this passage. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have what? Hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. So that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and I will sing hymns to your name. Again it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse, who we just read about, will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations, the Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if you picked up on it, but we had hope, and we had hope, and what do we have in the middle? Unity. Peace. And the promise to the patriarchs, the promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, that promise was that through your offspring, I'm not going to just bless you and your family. Through your offspring, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. Through your offspring, the Gentiles are going to be blessed, and they're going to come to know who I am. And so there's going to be unity, there's going to be restoration, where all peoples, Jews, the chosen instruments that God is going to work through, and Gentiles, all the other peoples that God is going to reach through the Jewish people, that God is saying, I'm going to bring about unity to where they all praise me. Amen. I'm going to be known. And so this is another way to talk about this peace. That you have Jews and Gentiles glorifying God together. And that is the hope. And so the hope surrounds all this. And at the center of this hope, there is this day of peace to where all people recognize that God is our maker, that God is our savior, that God is the one who is worthy of our lives, worthy of our trust, and worthy of our praise. Now, so, so this hope is a hope that produces unity. Let me say it differently. It's not simply a hope for unity. Like sometimes we hope for unity, and that's a good hope. But what this is saying, I think, is that because we have this hope, unity comes about. We have this hope that God is raising up Christ, and in Christ there is salvation for all peoples. And so out of that hope, a unity among all peoples is produced. And we're able to praise God together. We're able to rejoice together. We're able to share together and have peace together. The Gentiles will hope in the one who comes from Jesse. And Christ is the fulfillment of that promise. Okay, so probably the key line in all of this that gets me is verse 13. May the God of hope, the God who gives hope, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, my, my question is, one of my questions, what's that hope that falls right in God? You know, what, what, what is this hope? And it's interesting because if you kind of work in and out of Romans, you know, at one point back in chapter 3, Paul says, For we have all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. That we've all sinned, 
We've all messed up. And even now, we fall short of God's glory. Now, what does it mean to fall short of God's glory as, as a person? Okay, and I think what it means, me falling short of God's glory, means that I have not yet attained, taken hold of everything that God created me to be. That God saved me to be. That there is still plenty of room in my life for growth and transformation so that God will be truly glorified in my life, that my purpose will be fulfilled. Okay, are you kind of seeing that? Yeah. That that for me to fall short of the glory of God doesn't mean that I'm falling short of being God. Of course I'm not going to be God. But to fall short of the glory of God means that my life is not yet fulfilling everything that God created me to be and saved me to be. And so I'm not there yet. And so no matter how long I've been saved, no matter how long I've been walking with the Lord, no matter how much I'm growing in Christ's likeness, there's still more growth to be done. So that my life becomes a truer reflection of who Jesus is. So my purpose, it may be partially fulfilled, it may be being fulfilled, but it's not filled completely yet. I still fall short of his glory so that I don't truly reflect everything that he desires to do in my life at this point. But you know what is amazing? You turn a few pages over in Romans to chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have put right with God, trusting in Jesus and what Jesus has done. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in what? In the hope of the glory of God. So I fall short of the glory of God. And at the same time that I'm falling short of the glory of God, because of Christ Jesus, I stand in grace, and I have peace with God, and I'm able to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Do you hear what this hope is? This hope is that God is going to continue to do such a work in my life that one day I am so transformed that his purpose for me is fulfilled. And that I reflect. And that day happens ultimately resurrection day. Resurrection day when I have run my race and I have been resurrected and this body that is subject to decay is transformed so that body, spirit, my whole being reflects God's design for my life. Are you catching it? So here we were back in creation. God saw all that God had made and God saw that it was very good. And then we have the fall. And from that point on, we fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of being able to achieve or do or fulfill everything that he created us to be as humans. So praise God because of his work in Christ Jesus. We can stand at peace with God, even though we're falling short. We stand in grace. And not only do we stand in this grace, but we have this hope that one day God's purpose for us will be fulfilled. And we have the hope of the glory of God. Are you, are you catching this? So it's not like I am stuck forever, hopelessly, never going to fulfill my purpose. Hopelessly, yeah, I'm forgiven, praise God, but I'm never going to get there to where my life really glorifies God and God's doing everything in me and through me that God wants to do. No. If I understand Paul right, if I understand the gospel right, we have hope. The hope of the glory of God, that God will do all that God desires to do in us 
so that our lives truly fulfill our God-created purpose of reflecting Him. Now, that's a lot of hope. Go back with me now to Matthew, chapter 3. We've had our hope passages. Matthew chapter 3, at first look, doesn't look like a hope passage. It looks like a fear passage. Because here you have John the Baptist out there, and he's telling people that they better get ready, and that the axe is already laid at the root of the tree, and if they don't shape up and produce fruit in keeping with repentance, they're going to be chopped down and burned. <laughs> and they can't claim that they're Abraham's children, that's not going to mean anything. That they better get, and so that sounds like warning. And that sounds like fear. And, and so I've always kind of read it that way. And, and, and today it really kind of threw me a little bit in terms of these hope passages with this passage that looks kind of like a fear passage and a threat passage. <coughs> and so as I wrestled with that, it made me start to rethink John, you know, what is John the Baptist doing out there? He's getting people ready. What is he getting them ready for? He's getting ready for the thing that they've been praying for. That they've been longing for the day that God would raise up this one that Isaiah prophesied. And so John's whole ministry, while he's calling for people to repent, is actually a context of hope that, hey, God is working. And right on the immediate horizon, the kingdom of God is about to break in. And God is raising up this one who is going to usher in, who is going to establish God's rule and God's peace and God's righteousness. And so now I'm beginning to hear this a little bit differently. Rather than John out there kind of scaring them, hey, you better get ready, John's actually saying, hey, this is good news. You better get ready. I'm just curious, what motivates you more? Fear or hope? Sometimes we change because we're scared. And sometimes that change can be lasting change because we're scared. But I think more often than not, we change because there's hope. That there's the hope of being changed, there's a hope of being new, there's a hope of doing life differently. Whether it's a small thing or a little thing, you know, or a big thing, that we tend to make changes if we feel like the changes that we make will actually make a difference. That we have hope of a difference. And so if I don't feel like I'm really going to make any difference by, by making a change, it's like, why bother with the change? Or if I try to change and I fail, and I try to change and I fail, and I try to change and I fail, it kind of just becomes hopeless. And so why bother trying to change? But if I have hope, hope that change really is possible, then I'll try again. And I'll try again, and I'll try again. And I think John is preaching repentance in a context of hope, not simply a context of fear. And yes, he's giving warning, but in the broader context of John's ministry, and that time, it was a time of darkness. And John is saying, hey, the sun's about to come up. God's about to say, let there be light once again. That this promised king. His kingdom is at hand. And through him, God's going to establish peace. And so, get ready to receive the king. Change. And people are changing. They're going out to hear him and to be baptized by him, kind of a washing away of their old life and getting ready for this new king, hopeful that the king is going to come and establish his peace and his kingdom and they'll participate in it. And there are some who are coming out just to see what he's up to. And they're kind of self-righteous and they're the ones used to being in charge and John just kind of says, who warned you to come out? But you better change too. And so he's calling for them to repent, to change, and really that's what repentance is. It's a change of mind, it's a change of heart, it's a change of attitude, of actions. And so repent, why? Because the kingdom is near. That hope is about to be fulfilled. So turn from whatever you need to turn from, and turn to Jesus, turn to get ready, and produce 
truth. Now, John's words, this coming one will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John's just baptizing with water. It's an external washing, but it's not an internal change. But this one who's coming, he's going to baptize with the Spirit and with fire so that there will be real change. Sometimes scholars look at this and they think primarily in terms of John announcing that, that it will be the age of the Spirit and that when Jesus comes and this one comes, it's also going to be this incredible time of judgment. And then they kind of divide that up and think, okay, maybe John's a little bit off in his understanding of it, that the judgment is coming later, uh, the fire is coming later, and Jesus returned, and we're in the age of, spirit, of the Spirit now, and when Jesus returns, that will be fire. And that's where you'll have judgment. And, and no doubt there's some truth in that. But I'm not sure that's the whole truth. Because when I think about the baptism of what Jesus does in our lives, it's spirit and fire now. Amen. Spirit in terms of giving us new life. The fire in consuming that stuff within us, it's got to go. But there's no place for it in your life. So when there's an attitude of selfishness, hey, that's got to go now. If it's an attitude of pride and arrogance, that's got to go now. That the spirit and fire work together to where the spirit is giving us new life, but in order to receive that life and really live that new life, there's some things in our lives that kind of got to get consumed by that fire. And it may be a habit, it may be an attitude, it may be whoever, whatever it might be. And so this is the good news, is that this king who comes, he helps us change. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We don't just have to change on our own to get ready for him, that he comes so that we can be changed. And so that we can live through life. And so that we are empowered to be done with the old and to put on the new. Okay, are, are you not track with me? That in this context of hope, we can actually we can actually repent in hope and not just fear. That we can actually change, not in and of our own strength, but because he gives us his spirit. Because he's at work to change us and to consume whatever needs to be consumed in our lives that doesn't fit with the new life, that doesn't fit with his kingdom, that doesn't fit with his peace. So this morning as I'm, as I'm wrestling with this, I'm thinking about how hope produces repentance. Amen. How hope produces change. And that as we repent, as we change, this enables us to take hold of this hope even more. This hope of actually fulfilling what God created you for. Amen. This hope of actually being who God created me to be, who God saved me to be, the hope empowers change. And as we change, it's like we become taken captive by this hope more and more that we see that the Spirit's at work making a difference, that that hope is real, that I really can be changed, I really can be made Christ-like, I really can begin to live into what God created me for, who God saved me to be. And as we see that, it's just like there's more and more power, there's more and more momentum to keep changing and to keep growing. And to keep, I mean, that hope of the glory of God. So while I may fall short of God's glory, I am not without hope of God's glory. Thank you, Lord. Because as I turn to Christ, He's at work through His Spirit Amen. and through His fire to purge me of all those things that are not fitting for God's purpose for me. 
and to change me and grow me more and more. So Paul will say in other places, so that we are changed from glory unto glory unto glory. Taking hold of that for which Christ took hold of us. So, that one who is coming to establish peace will give us peace in the world. I, I guess this is my question for us. Do you recognize that we have opened up to change? Yes, we do. But sometimes, I think we live like we don't have hope. We live like we don't have the hope of being able to change. Because we're just thinking about what we can do on our own. And we try, and we fail time and time again. And so we become hopeless. And so there's no point in time again to change. That's not the truth. Well, I mean, that's the truth. We can't do it in and of ourselves. But that's not the whole truth. The whole truth is that we have the hope of change. But it's not in and of ourselves. It's the hope of Christ. It's the hope of the glory of God. And so, this one who comes, this one that we're anticipating his return, he's already at work now to prepare us for his return. So that the change begins now. And we can be, we can be in process of becoming more and more like him. And living into our God-given purpose of bringing him glory. So, this morning, I, I think I would like to, before we take communion, I think I would like to spend a little bit of time in prayer. And I don't know what changes you feel like the Lord has been talking to you about today, what repentance needs to take place in terms of turning from one thing to this thing, turning from that into the Lord, or this habit into a new habit that's going to be God glorified. I don't know. I don't know what the Lord is talking to you about in terms of change. But I, I want you to know that there's hope. Hope for change. And the hope is not I'm going to do it this time. The hope is His Spirit. The hope is that He will not forsake but he will continue to perfect the good work that he's begun with us. And so, don't give up, but invite him to help more and more. Help me change. And grant me that hope that I'll keep trying. I'll keep giving effort. Coupling my effort with the work of your spirit in my life. So would you bow your heads and pray, Bob? Maybe if you would come and just play silent, no singing. And you know, John called people out to the wilderness to be baptized. Sometimes it's helpful to kind of actually move and go and pray. If, if you want to come and pray here at these altars, you're welcome to come and pray here. Uh, if you want somebody to pray with you, you're glad to gather and pray with you. But if you want to just pray where you're at, and that's fine too. But I'd like for us to take a few moments in prayer, God. Help me to see what you want to change. God, I think I know what you want to change. God, help me to change. Change me by your spirit. I invite you to pray.
Lord, we confess that so many things we have tried over and over to change. We recognize we've just been trying to change them by our own strength. Have mercy upon us, we pray. Help us not to be so arrogant and so foolish yeah. to think that somehow we can accomplish the changes that we've been made by ourselves. Help us to hear the good news. Help us to hear that hope that you come to baptize us in your spirit. That you, by your work in us, will change us. So that instead of just falling short of your glory, we actually have the hope of your glory. So that instead of being at enmity with you, we actually stand in peace with you. Thank you. We pray, Lord, that we would be captured by this hope that you are at work to change us so that we are able to fulfill what you created us for. That we might honor you, that we might reflect you, and that people would come to know who you are through your work in our lives. We pray that you would empower us to change, empower us not to give up on repenting and turning from the things of this world, Help us, Lord, to keep turning to you, opening ourselves up to the ever deeper levels so that the change is more and more comprehensive and that the life that we live is truly new as you prepare us for that day when you return and you establish your kingdom of peace in all of its fullness and all of its glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. This time we're going to take communion and one more aspect where we invite Jesus to change us. And we're acknowledging that I can't be like Jesus on my own. The only way I can be like Jesus is to receive Jesus. And so Pastor D is going to come and he's going to pass out the elements, the bread and the cup. And it's your desire to continue on in this transformation, to be changed, uh, to be made more like Jesus. Let Pastor D know he will serve you. And once everybody has been served, then we will take the meeting together.